evening everybody. Hello, good evening to all. All right, so I hope everybody have a very good day today. Yeah, I know I have. All right, so in Penang today, it was raining just now. Now it just stopped. It's very good view and everything. Uh, and I hope we're going to have fun yeah, today, tonight. Uh, but before we start our program, it's already 8.30. Yeah, we have a few uh, watching us through live in Facebook and also in this Zoom link. Um, I will give some housekeeping notes before we start. So the first uh, thing I'm going to announce is, of course, just now I, I already said it, we have also from the Zoom and also you can also watching this through our Facebook page live. Yeah, you can uh, just follow, uh, just look for our Facebook Malaysian Primatological Society and watch there. And I would like to inform uh, everybody who are in the Zoom for, uh, for you guys to uh, off your video and also mute your microphone throughout the program. Um, don't worry because we're going to allow questions during our open mic session in the end of our program. Okay, or you can can directly ask questions in our chat box anytime or even in our comment section um, at our Facebook Live. All right. Um, yeah, another thing is because of our international and also regional participation, therefore we have uh, this event in English. Okay. However, those wanting to post in Bahasa Melayu or Indonesia or any other language are welcome to do so in the chat or in our Facebook comment section. So one gentle reminder to all the content contributors, uh, you also can put uh, your contact info in the text and also entertain any question in the chat box or MPS Facebook page comment section. I would like to repeat the announcement. Um, I would like to ask everybody who are in the Zoom, please off your video and also mute your microphone. Thank you. Okay. And also the last thing is because of um, this online version of Campfire, okay? So kindly bear with us for any technical difficulty that might occur throughout the evening and let's try having fun tonight, okay? All right, again, welcome and good evening to everyone, okay? Uh, to this virtual campfire. Uh, we have organized this virtual campfire together with Southeast Asian Primatological Association and also IUCN SSC Primate Specialist Group. My name is Zaki. I am the president of the Malaysian Primatological Society, and I will be your host tonight. I mean, this, this evening, okay? <laughs> all right, so today is the World Primate Day, as we all know. And as every year, this day reminds us to celebrate our biodiversity and also natural heritage. Southeast Asia region is one of the most biodiverse region in the world with an astounding 98 species of primate, where 25 of them in Malaysia alone, okay? And while these fascinating creatures are human's closest cousin, they are also the ones who are most vulnerable to our action. Currently, there are about 60% of all primate species worldwide are reported to be threatened yeah, due to habitat loss and fragmentation, hunting, and the worst of all, the illegal primate trade. Deforestation to offer to open new infrastructure, industry. <coughs> I'm sorry. <clears throat> Deforestation to open new infrastructure, industry, and agriculture leaves these animals that are highly dependent on intact canopies persisting in the remaining forest fragment, threatening their long-term survival. So the purpose of tonight is to bring together a wide range of people who work in primate research or conservation who appreciate primate as object of their art, or simply who love to see this beautiful animal during their nature walk, or even from the breeze of the balcony during this ongoing prime uh, pandemic, yeah, from your house and everything. So let us together enjoy the diversity of our primates and the people and stories who tell about them through a variety of videos, storytelling, music, and also art. Let us understand that we don't have to be an expert or researcher or conservationists to help protecting these animals, but all of us can cherish them, talk about them, and share their plight. Let this night be a night to celebrate our primate. So welcome to our campfire. So first in the evening, let's start our night with an interesting field trip video from Night Sporting Project. What did the dog die now, huh? 
You know what the best thing to do in the dark night? Searching for a slow loris, a non-tenant animal. So, let's go. But first, don't forget your equipment. Okay, I'm ready. Let's go. So, to look for slow lowers in the night, what we need is the red light. We don't use a white light because it will hurt the slow lorry's eyes and non tenant animal eyes. So with the red light, how can we spot the slow lorries is when we see the flash, the reflection of the eyes from the slow lorries and we can know where is the slow lorries. So let's go try find some. Well, it looks like I cannot find any. So what we're doing is right now we're using another equipment which is a thermal camera. This is thermal camera. We can use this to look for slowlories if we cannot see it with our naked eyes. With this thermal camera, we can see slowlories if it's behind the leaf. So, what we need to do is just on turn on the thermal camera and then look again at the tree. Oh, okay. I found one up on the tree there. Let's find with the light. Oh look, we are lucky. There's not just one but two slowlories. This is really cute and actually slowlories are social animal. I think it's time to we leave them alone. Let's find another one. Let's go. Oh, look, I found one in the power line. Do you see how fast it's running? Slow lorries are not really slow. They are also found around the village like here in this video. Oh, he's gone. So I think this is all for tonight. I hope you guys enjoy the walk with me. Looking for the slow lorries. It's a really late, so I think I should go to the bed now. See you guys again. Good night. Wow. <clears throat> I really hope I can be there. Thank you, Night Sporting Project. And behind this project is Priscilla and Pizri. They are doing their project in Langkawi. Um, thank you for opening our campfire session with such a fun night walk. And if you guys want to know more about Nocturnal Wildlife, please contact Night Sporting Project directly. Right? Uh, there are indeed many different methods to study primate in the whole world. It's either by following them, like just now, like what Fizri does, or on foot, yeah? And also taking direct observation in the field. You can also climb the tree to put up cameras or sound recorder. You can either use all other technologies like infrared cameras for nocturnal primates, bioacoustic monitoring, drones, as well as camera trapping. Now, let's introduce you to some ways to do fieldwork. We would like to give special thanks for this video to Association Anulak in Laos for providing us with beautiful camera trap pictures for our potpourri of Southeast Asian fascinating primates. Please enjoy. My name is Nadine Rupert, and I'm the head of the Makaka Nemestrina project. Pigtail macaques are found in peninsular Malaysia, Borneo, and Sumatra. But they are becoming increasingly threatened by habitat loss.
My students and I study how they can adapt to human-influenced habitats, such as oil palm plantations. Our recent discovery of their role as biological pest control in plantations has opened new perspectives to protect these charismatic primates and their forest habitats near plantations, as they benefit planters by devouring a large number of plantation rats, the major pest in oil palm agriculture. By protecting forests, we will allow macaques to enter nearby plantations and hunt for rats, a true win-win situation for biodiversity and people. Can you hear those beautiful sound? Animals use sound for communication, echolocation, sexual display, and territorial defense. Bioacoustic monitoring involves the recording of those sound to infer animal distribution, physiological state, abundance, and behavior. Recently, the popularity of passive acoustic monitoring has grown very rapidly and taken advantage of innovations for consumer technology such as smartphones. Passive acoustic monitoring can help forest management, especially to observe a boreal wildlife that live high in the canopy. Diverse range of sounds will expand our understanding of this rich, biologically diverse planet. Hi, hello everyone. My name is Iza. Here I would like to share about our Gibbon project in Taman Negara Pahang. In Taman Negara Pahang, we are working closely with indigenous Batik tribe as our project assistant. And here I would like to share a part of a video on how the indigenous Batik tribe set up the recorder up to 10 meter height on the tree which is also part of a bioacoustic study for our Gibbon project. Indigenous Batik assistant also help us in identify the Gibbon fruit in Taman Negara Pahang. So here the example of the fruit identified by indigenous assistant as the gibbon fruit.
Wow, you see that? How fun is it to work with primate in the wild? See? You really can't be afraid of height when installing those traps, of course. But the effort are truly rewarding, I'm sure. So it is amazing to see how indigenous field assistants climb those trees as if they had a ladder. Indeed, involving indigenous in the research and conservation of Malaysia primate is facilitating crucial partnership to safeguard precious wildlife. So let us hear from WCS Malaysia about indigenous primate folk tales. WCS, the WCS aims to help community preserve oral history and traditional knowledge, especially those that show how nature contribute to their unique identity in a written published format. So this culminated into the publication of the folklore book in 2021 entitled Wildlife Tales and Iban Myth from Sabah and Gunung Lesong. The book had a soft launch during a recent UNDP Malaysia's event in conjunction with the World's Indigenous People's Day 2021. So let's hear about it. Hai, bukian yang tinggi, kena orang nyawa kak dia magam. Ah, petara. Petara bagaimana? Ah, tidak keliang, tidak laja, tidak tempungga, tidak tempurai. Penyaga Jelusiga Menua Malaysia WCS Mike ke kita Jerita Jelusiga Ngau pengidu Bansa Iban Jerita Nanggai Jadi Ngau Bunsu Mayas Tusun Kedua Nampuang Jerita Nanggai Ngau Bunsu Mayas Bat Tusun Yang Kedua Kedi Tusi Mr. Jampi Yang Nak Ngumpang Hari Rumah Edu Yes so this is indeed a very well done effort by WCS in preserving the local heritage and local knowledge. 
So while many of us try our best to be the as least invasive as possible when observing primate or even when researching them, unfortunately, a wide public belief that primates make cute pets, this is very saddening. And the exploitation of primates is openly showcased on social media. Let's take a moment to remember that primates are not pets. Learn something. So we hope that you guys can really help us in spreading the word that primate is not pets. There is one family of primates whose orange babies are especially sought after as pets. Otherwise, these primates are often somehow overlooked as they are shy and rest a lot during the day. They have a special diet consisting mainly of leaf, which needs energy and time to be digested. Lenga, or leaf-eating monkey, of the family colobins, have a staggering 58 different species in the Asian region alone. Let the next few minutes be dedicated to different species of langurs. Learn about the silver langurs from Peninsula Malaysia first in this video premiere brought to us by our friend from Laya Lia. You can find more interesting videos about Malaysian wildlife and beautiful activity books for children on their social media. Kindly contact them directly. Let us enjoy their videos. Kenapi hutan tropika kelihatan bergemelapan. Ternampak susuk tubuh kecil bergayut dari pokok ke pokok. Inilah lotong kelabu. Lotong kelabu mendapat nama dari warna bulunya yang kelabu keperakkan dan wajahnya yang gelap menjadikan ia mudah dikenali di celah kehijauan dedaun. Di Malaysia, ia biasanya dijumpai di hutan-hutan berhampiran pesisir pantai, sungai dan hutan paya bakau. Lotong kelabu ialah haiwan diurnal iaitu haiwan yang aktif di siang hari sehingga matahari terbenam. Ia merupakan haiwan herbivor dan antara makanan kegemarannya adalah pelbagai jenis daun dan pucuk tumbuhan. Lotong kelabu kadang-kala akan turun ke darat untuk memakan busut anai-anai. Ia berperanan sebagai nutrien tambahan dan melegakan sakit perut. Disebabkan dietnya yang kurang bernutrisi, ia sering berehat pada siang hari. Lotong kelabu hidup secara berkumpulan, diketuai oleh seekor lotong jantan. Ia akan mengawan dengan beberapa ekor lotong betina. Tahukah anda, bayi lotong berwarna jingga Ini membolehkan ia mudah dilihat oleh ibunya dan lontong betina yang lain. 
Bayi lotong akan dijaga dan disusukan oleh beberapa ekor lotong betina. Juga dikenali sebagai alo mothering. Selepas tiga ke lima bulan, bulunya bertukar ke warna hitam di kepala, tangan dan kakinya. Selepas dua belas bulan, bulunya bertukar ke warna kelabu keperakan sepenuhnya. Di usia tiga tahun, anak lotong kini meningkat dewasa dan akan memulakan keluarganya sendiri. Lotong kelabu merupakan spesies yang terancam akibat aktiviti manusia seperti penembangan hutan dan pembangunan. Anaknya yang comel juga ditangkap dan dijual sebagai haiwan peliharaan. Ini merupakan satu kesalahan di sisi undang-undang. Kita perlu memainkan peranan bagi melindungi kelangsungan spesies yang unik dan mempesonakan ini. Kita harus memastikan sekilas warna jingga dan perak ini dapat terus dilihat di celah rimbunan kanopi pokok untuk selama-lamanya. inspiring. Thank you so much Laya Liar for allowing us to premiere this beautiful video tonight. So, we will now show you some more short clips about a few Langer species found in Peninsula and Borneo. Thank you to One Stop Borneo Wildlife, KL Leaf Monkey, Roots and Shoot Malaysia and One Academy and Langer Project Penang for these beautiful clips. Please enjoy. Hi Malaysians, do you know our langurs? Langurs are also called leaf monkeys due to their diet mainly consisting of leaves and occasionally flowers and fruits. We have five species in Peninsula Malaysia. Let's learn about them. The dusky langur is also called spectacled langur due to its white eye rings which look like a pair of spectacles. They can be found in most of Peninsular Malaysia, even on the islands of Penang, Langkawi and Perhentian. The Slango Silvered Langer, which has silvery speckles on its fur, is a mangrove forest specialist. It can be found in Slangor and other states in Malaysia. The infants of both, the Dusky Langer and Silvered Langer, are orange in their natal fur color. The Pale Thighed Langer, also known as White Thighed Suri Leaf, is common around central peninsula Malaysia. You can find them in highlands like Fraser's Hill or even in the city green of Kuala Lumpur. The Robinson's banded langur is maybe the least known langur in peninsula Malaysia. While being nearly identical to its cousin, the Raffles banded langur, the Robinson's banded langur can have incomplete eye rings and mouth patches, which makes it stand out from the others. It can be found north of Sungai Perak, and its range extends all the way to southern Thailand and Myanmar. The Raffles banded langur is probably the most endangered primate in Peninsula Malaysia due to its small distribution range, highly fragmented habitat and small population size. It can be found only in Johor and south of Pahang, as well as the Republic of Singapore. Sadly, many of our primates are facing the threats of habitat loss, road kills, illegal primate trade and hunting. Let's do our part and be a citizen scientist Look for langurs living near you, treasure them, 
observe their life on treetops from afar and report your interesting sightings to us. Visit Facebook Malaysian Primatological Society. The red leaf monkey, also known as the maragang, it likes to eat unripe fruit or leaves. So right now there is a family of red leaf monkey eating ficus leprecarpa, unripe fruit and leaves right over there. Meet the white-thighed cirilli, Presbytus siamensis. Although we have many of these leaf monkeys living right in the center of Kuala Lumpur, in some ways they are the lesser known leaf monkey. Generally you'll hear them before you see them. They have extremely long tails, lanky arms and legs and are found perched on the crook of a tree or leaping past you nestled in family groups of about 10 to 15, or sometimes a trio of outliers. They are mostly timid and quick to move on if they catch sight of you. That's unless the treat they're feasting on is just too hard to resist. Living right in the center of Kuala Lumpur, but unknown to many, we need to raise their profile. Please help. Find out more from leafmonkey.kl. Welcome to the story of Dusky Langers. Dusky Langers, also known as the Spectacle Langers or Dusky Leaf Monkeys. This species is well known for their white round spectacles and charismatic appearance. Duskies means dark in color and Langer means leaf eating monkey. They are arboreal, depending on trees to survive where the species mainly feed on young leaves, fruits and flowers. The dusky langers have great balancing on trees, where they can sleep, sit and grooming each other on tree branches. Dusky langers can be found in Myanmar, Thailand and Peninsula Malaysia, including small islands. There is a big boss, the alpha male in a group of dusky langers, where he leads the family to forage and feeds, at the same time protecting the family members. Sounds like our fathers, right? Besides staying in the forest, we can find the dusky langers by the coastal area, in recreational parks where they are more used to human presence, and even urban areas where the species is struggling to survive in a human-impacted world. Do you know that the dusky langers is an endangered species under the IUCN Red List? Wow, look at the babies of the dusky langers. They are bright orange in colors, where the color serves as a reminder to the family members to pay attention to the baby, to ensure the safety and well-being of the young one. The baby has a strong bond with the mother. Here. The mummy dusky langer is grooming the orange baby. As the baby grows, the orange fur will slowly shed off and replace with growth of dark greyish fur by five months old. Overall, 
dusky langurs, they are very similar to us humans. We are all social animals. We are all primate species. See, they are so cute and we can't have enough of them. So we are going to talk about this charismatic animal some more. Langurs not only live among their own species, but often in close association with other forest dwellers. Let's hear a story of the dusky langurs and record tail drongo from Ishad Mubarak. Please welcome Ishad. Hi everybody, uh, just a second. Let me share my screen. Okay, can you all see that? Yes, it's clear. Okay, good. Uh, my name is Irshad. I live on a little island, the very north of Peninsula Malaysia. It's called Langkawi. Uh, but the story about this, the racket tail drongo, and, um, oops, uh, it's not moving to the next slide. Can somebody? Can you try to minimize it back? Sure. Yeah. Just press escape. I did, yeah. Oh, it's not moving. No, not at all. Um, Ethan, maybe you can help. Or perhaps you can just try to unshare and try to share again. Okay. Oh, there it is. All right. Okay. Okay, good. Well, uh, when I was about nine years old, my father presented me a little book about the birds of Malaysia. Uh, printed by um, Dewan Bahasa dan Purstaka. It was a bird on the, it was a book on the birds of Malaysia. And among the few, the many birds uh, they were in, that was in the book, uh, one fascinating bir bird was called the greater racket tail drongo. Now bear in mind, I'm about nine years old. And in that book, they talked, they mentioned that the greater racket tail drongo is often seen with monkeys. And that was it. It didn't give any explanation of why uh, it, that observation was made. It just stated the fact that you can usually see this bird with the monkeys. Well, it will be another 20 years before I will discover uh, the reason. Wherever the monkeys are in the morning, the racket tail drongo will follow the group. And when monkeys travel from branch to branch, as they jump from branch to branch, they trash the branch heavily. This disturbs insects, and insects are flushed out, and the drongo then snaps up these insects. So obviously that was the reason that this monkey follows, uh, sorry, this bird travels with the monkeys, be it the long tailed macaque or the dusky langur. But then I will later even discover another partner in the whole relationship. And this relationship was between the racket tail drongo the dusky langur, the dusky leaf monkey, and the giant squirrel, as well as the sunda squirrel. Now, a big enemy of baby monkeys in our forest are the greater, sorry, are the mountain hawk eagle. That's the baddest bird on Langkawi. The crested serpent eagle and the changeable hawk eagle. These relatively large birds of prey, not only eat snakes and lizards, but they tend to take even at times small mammals. I've seen them take giant squirrels, sunda squirrels, and unattended baby monkeys. 
So this interaction is really interesting between these three animals. Whenever a bird of prey, an eagle, is flying low over the forest canopy, it's usually the squirrels that first spots them. And it's the squirrels that give off the first alarm. And squirrels give up, give the alarm according to the level of danger the enemy affords the squirrel world. So in the squirrel world, you have yellow alert, orange alert, red alert, and in the case of the mountain hawk eagle, it's severe status. And squirrels telegraph the information. As the eagle goes over the first alarm call, all the squirrels in the valley are now uh, on alert. It passes the next squirrel, and that squirrel goes kick, 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 kick. And the next squirrel goes kick, 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 kick. They telecraft the direction the bird of prey is heading. And if that bird of prey then settles on a, on a tree, rest assured that the rac if there's racket tail drongos nearby, the racket tail drongo will search out for the enemy. Upon finding the enemy, upon finding the enemy, uh, the drongo then rushes to the spot, gives a second alarm. This second alarm brings maybe two, three, four, even five drongos together, especially when the mountain hawk eagle is about, you can get about five or six drongos surrounding the bird of prey. And here you can see in this slide, there's a, a, a bird of prey on that end and a crested serpent eagle, uh, sorry, and a, a drongo right at the bottom there just keeping an eye out. Now these birds cannot kill, these little tiny birds, the drongo cannot kill an eagle, but it's enough of a nuisance. It tells everybody in the valley exactly, every animal in the valley exactly where the eagle is. And it's a real nuisance for the eagle. And when the eagle decides it's time to take off and fly off, the drongos then will mob and harass it. Even I've seen it so many times, taking the feathers of the head of the eagle. I've seen it more than a dozen, two dozen times. Now I don't record the number of times. So the poor eagle then has to pack up and find another valley, hopefully not to be spotted this time, or pick on those poor animals that have no hearing or have poor hearing and poor eyesight. So in the end, it's the, it's the snakes and the lizards that get. And this way, yeah, I've seen where birds and monkeys and squirrels and different animals interact with each other. They understand each other's alarm call. And in the case of the, of the monkey, the squirrel and this little drongo, there's this lovely relationship, uh, interspecies um, partnership, you so-called. And this way, they not only get a meal for themselves, the drongo, but the monkeys and even the squirrels are likewise, in a way, uh, protected uh, by this little tiny hector protector of the forest, the greater racket tail drongo. I've seen even a, a, a little bird like the flower pecker. It discovers there's a snake on a tree. It gives out its alarm call. All animals understand each other's alarm call. I've seen a little squirrel come right down to have a look at what was, uh, what the, what was the little flower pecker uh, alarm call all about. It discovers that. Then I see monkeys coming and having a look and it was a snake coiled up on one of the, the lower branches. And this way birds, animals, they interact, they understand each other all the time. I hope you enjoyed that. Yes, we do enjoy it a lot. And I'm having a hard time to stop you, you know, because of this is very, very interesting to listen to you. And we hope we have more time. Thank you so Thank much you. for your amazing, amazing stories. Thank okay. You. So uh, now I would like to invite my dear friend, Jolene Yap, for our next interesting stage uh, session. Please welcome, Jolene.
Hi everyone, happy World Primate Day. So thank you so much for tuning in in Zoom, Facebook, and YouTube as well. And uh, we must celebrate World Primate Day with a song, right? So uh, I'm from Langer Project Penang. So my team members and I, we have created a children's sing-along song, not only for children, but also for all ages. So please sing along this music video where there are lyrics on the screen. So let's be happy and be cheerful to celebrate this evening. All right, okay, pass to you, Zaki. What a catchy song okay trust me i already added it into my playlist it's very very nice okay thank you jolene and victor it is very refreshing yeah having a campfire online and still feeling the vibes so uh, actually um you know probably some of us might leave earlier so i think it's better, it's best if we can have our group photo now rather than later okay should anybody want to take some picture yeah especially for those who are in our zoom Kindly turn on your video and we can snap a few and then I, we can continue with the program. Yeah. All right. Another moment. Is everybody ready? Okay. Wait, I need to change my setting. How do we change the setting into more people in one screen? Okay, view. Okay. So, okay. One, two, three, smile. Can I have another one? One, two, three, smile. One more. One, two, three, smile. Thank you so much, everybody. Okay, you can turn off your videos and we can continue. All right. <laughs> so, apart from Langers, of course, we cannot only spot Langer's hide up in the trees, but also Asia's fastest primates, our fascinating small apes, also called gibbons. Yeah, finally, they are also known as the singing and swinging apes and are the fastest of all arboreal species, reaching top speed of up to 55 kilometers per hour. Let's learn more about gibbons in our next segment, introducing the gibbon from Malaysia and Java.
Gibbons are among the most endangered groups of primates, with 20 species, five of which are critically endangered, 14 endangered, and one is vulnerable. They are found only in Asia, in a total of 11 countries, these being Bangladesh, Brunei, Cambodia, China, India, Indonesia, Laos, Malaysia, Myanmar, Thailand, and finally Vietnam. In Peninsular Malaysia, where we operate, three gibbon species can be found. These are the Agile gibbon, the Lar gibbon, and the Siamang. All of them are endangered. The mostly threatened by forest clearing for plantation agriculture, by selective logging, and a dense road network. Because gibbons live high up in the tree canopy, they really descend to the ground and have difficulty crossing over roads and other obstacles. They may use electrical transmission lines to move between habitat fragments, but because of this, they risk being electrocuted. To combat this, canopy bridges can be built over roads, agricultural land, pipelines and other infrastructural development to help animals cross safely. For gibbons, only three successful canopy bridges have been reportedly built. These are in India, and China, and in Thailand. However, for other primate species, many canopy bridges exist across the globe, such as for marmosets in Brazil, for titi monkeys in Costa Rica, colbus monkeys in Kenya, for somango monkeys in South Africa, for lion tailed macaques in India, for orangutans in Borneo for Java and slow lorises in West Java, and finally, also dusky langurs in our very own Malaysia. We hope to continue expanding these canopy bridges for gibbons and create a network across peninsular Malaysia in the very near future. From 20 gibbon species in the world, 9 species are living in Indonesia. They are distributed in the 3 different main islands. 4 species are living in Sumatra, another 4 species living in Kalimantan, and 1 species is living in Java Island. That's part of the great call of the female of Javan gibbon. All gibbon species are known to produce a loud, long, and well-patterned song. The gibbon songs have several functions, including to defend the resources such as territories, food sources, and also meat, and it also has a function as the main attraction and to strengthening the pair bond. Why small apes are important? There is unseparative interaction between the rainforest and the small apes or gibbons. The small apes help the forest to keep regenerate by acting as a good seed dispersal agent. Fruit are the most important foods for the small apes. Usually, they swallow the whole fruits together with the seeds, and later, the seeds are scattered through their faces in the home range in the rainforest. The gibbons might be small, but their action cannot be forgotten.
Thanks to Unka and Rahayu Octaviani for the wonderful and informative videos about gibbons okay so for the next part we're going to play a little game i would like to invite my friend ethan to coordinate the gibbon trivia game please welcome ethan all right good evening everyone i hope uh, you guys are enjoying uh, yourself over here so uh, today I'm just going to uh, uh, um, keep up uh, the beat with a little game with all of you. So I guess many of you have uh, hiked or traveled to some forest in Malaysia or at, at least in this region of Southeast Asia. So you might have uh, heard the given calls over here. So there are just a quick recap, there are 20 species of small apes across Southeast Asia, South China, and, and South Asia. So uh, in Malaysia alone, we have five. So three over in the peninsula, two over in uh, Malaysian Borneo. I'm going to play a few songs of our gibbons, and I will need you guys to guess which species is this. So the first one, I will, I will, of course, I will keep the easiest for the first one. I'm going to play the song and in the chat, please answer which species of small apes is this. It's pretty easy, it's pretty obvious. Yeah, I can already see someone is. Oh, it's blowing my ear off using using this headphone alone. So yes, you are right. These are siamang. So when they do this, uh, they are about to go into the, the great call part of the whole song. All right. So the next song over here. All right. Get ready. Who is singing? Yeah, I can see some answer here. Gibbons, Hello Babies. Which Hello Babies though? White handed Lara's Gibbon. Mm -hmm. Any more answers? Well, well done. Uh, the answer, yes, you are right. These are white-handed gibbons. So the, the high pitch of the call that you have just heard are uh, made by the female of the family group. Okay, And once she is done with that, the male comes in and that kind of concludes the, the chorus part of the whole song. The song can last for uh, one hour or even more, but between... In between, you have this great call, also called the chorus of the song. So this is, again, this is a white-handed gibbon song, also called, also known as the Lara gibbon. What about this one? Okay, some say it is the Agile Gibbon. Any more answers? Black handed Gibbons? It's pretty similar to Lara Gibbon, isn't it? Okay, I, I, got, I already got some correct answer. Yes, they are Agile Gibbons, also known as the Black handed Gibbons. So the songs are pretty similar, but you can already tell it is shorter than that of the Lara Gibbon. And then when the male comes in in the end, it is very different from that of the uh, the Lara Gibbon. So the answer is the Agile Gibbon. All right, it's pretty similar, but uh, after a few more practice, you'll be able to tell the difference between the two. So again, these are the three musketeer, three musketeers of the peninsulas, Malaysia's Gibbon. So Siamang, Lara Gibbon, and Agile Gibbon. Well done, well done. Very interesting, Ethan. You know what? I didn't get any of them. <laughs> okay. 
because I don't have a very good hearing. But next time, I would love to suggest a choir by us, but only by using primate sound. I'm sure this will be a hit. Okay, so moving on. Asia is also home to another ape, yeah? the magnificent orangutan. In fact, Asia's only great apes with three species from Sumatra and Borneo. Orangutans build nests in trees to have a comfortable bed at night and rely on ripe forest fruits, such as figs as their staple food. So now let's watch a short clip with orangutans indulging on figs on, in Borneo by Sid Prudente, followed by an animation, animation to learn why and how orangutan build nest. Figs are a keystone species in many tropical forest ecosystems. In the Borneo rainforest, more than 150 species have been recorded. These fruits are a major food source for wildlife, especially orangutans. Orangutans play a vital ecological role as seed disperses in the rainforest. They influence both forest regeneration and species diversity. They also have a role in propagation. Many fruit seedlings sprout only after having passed through an animal's digestive system. Orangutans eat more than 400 different plant varieties and spend up to six hours a day eating or foraging for food. There is a great deal that a young orangutan must learn in order to survive in the wild. To find fruiting trees, orangutans memorize their locations, track seasonal changes, and also observe the behavior of other animals. Generally, both human and non-human primates have a favorite fruit season. When it comes to durians, sharing is caring. Orangutans, the great ape, depends their life on the trees, making them a boreal. They forage, play and seek for shelter on the canopy. Orangutans will continue their routine until night comes around, and then they will build their sleeping nest. They are very selective in choosing the trees for their sleeping nest. A strong and sturdy tree will be needed to build the nest. This palm tree could have larger branch, so it might not be suitable too. These orangutans will move away to the other trees. After a while, orangutans might have found one good spot, and then they climb up, making their way to the top. Beside the nest, orangutans build head covers and nest covers too. To build the nest, they will bend the first branch, pluck it and make the foundation of the nest. To make the nest stronger, they added more roughly concentration of the branches. The nest foundation almost finished. They will also make some other features such as pillow, roofs and mattresses. These features will be made by small twigs or leaves and small branches. Nest counting has been a tool to count population of orangutans. Recently, we used drones to study on the ecology of the nest, also to track down the location of the nest. Based on the drone survey, we can also understand what kind of forest type orangutans is living at. Most importantly, we could understand how to conserve orangutans and rainforests in the future. Thank you everyone for these informative clips. Orangutans are also often object of various form of arts. And Sanjit is here with us, and he will tell us a touching story about a blind orangutan in his photographic journey. Please welcome Sanjit. Thank you, Zaki. Just give me a moment and I'll share my screen. I hope you can see the slides up there. Tell me if you can, Zaki. Yes, I can. Okay, so um, good evening, everybody. Welcome to Borneo and happy World Primate Day. 
Um, I'm Sanjit, and I've been uh, documenting Malaysian wildlife through photography close to two decades now. Uh, being part of Gaia, which uh, leads the hornbill research, we're always looking up into the trees. In Borneo, while looking up into the trees, we're often graced with the world's largest arboreal mammal. Okay. So now this is a rather peculiar sight um, when we came across this. Uh, this is not something you see every day. Um, you know, when I stumbled upon it, um, I was wondering, you know, did this orangutan purchase a bungalow with a rainforest view to enjoy a party with her girlfriends or taking a break after a long day and shooting the breeze? Is she severely injured? Uh, she is seated in a rather stylish manner, but despite my imagination, going wild with assumptions, this is certainly an extraordinary scene for such a remarkable species. Um, this set of images were taken at the Gumanchung Caves area where, where we were meant to document hornbill behavior, but the orangutan stole our attention for that evening. So as amazing as that was, at the other end of the longhouse where the female was seated, there was some rustling and movement of a younger orangutan uh, this playing with low hanging branches. You know, there's pretty much a feet off the ground and it was biting on this target, discarded coconut husk. So I was also looking pretty solemn. Yeah? And we need to remember that our long houses are built on stilts and this young one has ample of shade, but there's still something missing here. Right, let's go. So, at Gumantung, um, we were all seated at the boardwalk at different spots. So it's kind of like a Y-shaped boardwalk. Um, a couple of locals walked up and um, rolled a jackfruit towards the female. So she went down the stairs and walked across the field with caution. Uh, she stopped a couple of times and um, she kept looking back at the younger orangutan. And she eventually proceeded towards the jackfruit and she held it with both hands. Yeah. And at that point, we came to realize that this orangutan is at the mercy of humans. Now, I could hear teammates chatting with locals with the word buta, buta, you know, that means blind. And they mentioned it quite a number of times, you know. And, and I looked at these guys as they walked away. Um, they work at the caves, right? And they calmly just walked past and they just went about their own business. Of course, um, this is where the bond gets stronger. You know, accepting the jackfruit, the female signals to the younger orangutan to join us. You know, as though she was cautious earlier on to protect the young before she inspects the fruit. You know? So the young joined her, they indulged in this evening delight and they went back towards the house as the sun was getting low. So as they were going back to the house, you know, I managed to capture a, fem a portrait of the female orangutan. And you can clearly see that she's got bad cataracts in one eye. I mean, this alone can impair their judgment tremendously, especially for an arboreal species. So being a field as a photographer for almost two decades now, there's a lot of things that we can learn uh, from wildlife. Yeah. To me, conservation is about solutions, correlations, uh, it's about existing in every circumstance. So, and, you know, throughout the years and decades, we've all heard stories about correlation and we will hear more stories about correlation between human and, and wildlife. Yeah. This particular piece of art that I've created of the female orangutan is a testament that humans can live harmoniously with the wildlife we can share and we should not be blind about it. Back to you, Zaki. Thank you so much, Sanjit. This is indeed a very touching story. Thank you so much for the sharing. Yeah. And right now, our first festival of primates and also campfire has almost come to an end. Let us celebrate our diverse primates once more with a photographic journey of Malaysian primates 
in the heart of city center of Kuala Lumpur by Peter Ong and a song performed by Elvira Aro. Please welcome. My gosh, <laughs> what a voice. I enjoyed that very, very much. This was fantastic. Thank you, Peter and Elvira. Now we are celebrating the diversity of primates and people studying, watching, photographing, painting, singing, conserving, and cherishing them with another potpourri of species and their fascinating behavior in this last clip before we get together for an open chatting session around our virtual campfire where everyone can ask questions or tell a short story about your favorite primates. Thanks so much to everyone who contributed materials for this evening, especially our friends from Association Anulag Laos, Jane Goodall Institute Singapore, the Javan Gibbon Project in Indonesia, and from all other around Peninsula Malaysia and Borneo. Enjoy.
Thank you so much, everybody, for staying with us until the end. So right now, we are open to all for questions and anecdotes. You can, you know, like you can open your video or you can open your microphone. If you have any question, you can just direct the question to whoever you like, or you can just ask and somebody will try to answer for you. Anyone has anything to say? This is the time. Hello. Yes. Hi, uh, Yen Yi here. Hi, Yen Yi. Yeah, just. I have a ahead. question for Jolene. Jolene, are you here? <laughs> Or maybe just, yeah. Yes, okay. I'm here. I'm here because I'm managing the Facebook chat. So I'm, uh, yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, I, had, I had a question about um, the uh, languors in general. Do you know what age do they start singing or do it? Oh, what age is languor? They don't really sing. Uh, oh. They just, call. yeah. So normally they honk and they call. Yeah. So uh, Gibbon sings. Are you referring to the questions on Gibbons? Oh, well, any type of vocalization like uh, can be called a song, <laughs> actually. All right. Yeah. Um, Ethan, do you want to answer this? Hey, Yen Yi. I, I'm unsure about the age of the even, but uh, they become sexually mature at around the age of 6 to 10 years old. Uh, the female will take longer to mature. But before they, they uh, leave the family and they start vocalizing, they will 
they will learn from their parents to sing actually. In fact, uh, from the the audio I played just now, the, the, the one yeah. with the given, you can actually listen, uh, hear there are two females making a great call in that particular group. Okay, uh, try to record that. Uh, otherwise, I can send you the audio. There are two females singing in that particular group. Okay, the daughter is learning from the mother. So let's say the mother is about 10 years old plus, and the daughter must be younger than that. Okay, very interesting. Um, do you All know right. if they have some... Yes. Sorry, <laughs> no maybe problem. the next no person problem. can ask questions. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. I just want to ask if Zimbo have anything to say. Hello there. Hi. You shouldn't be dragging me into this. You're all having fun already. Uh, instead of saying something, well, I mean, I've enjoyed it. That was fantastic. I really appreciate what you all have been doing. Uh, maybe uh, if you have questions, that'd be better. Any weird questions or tough question about primates, maybe I'll handle that. Or if you want to hear some odd things about primates that you don't think can happen, then you can ask me. Anyone? Okay, I'll throw you one then. Uh, I'll throw it as a question, uh, as a statement rather than explaining the whole thing because it'll, it'll be another lecture. We don't want a lecture today. So, okay, one, some primate species practice infanticide, full stop. Two, uh, a number of primate species, social primate species, practice sneak copulation, full stop. Okay, that's your two snippets for the day. All right. So if there's nothing, I'll just turn my, my camera off. Hi, right. I, I have something to Flip. say. Oh, can, I, can I start it? Yeah, yeah, please. This is an open session. Yeah, I just want to say to uh, Yen Yi just now, um, in the park I'm living in, in Tawao, um, there's a family of gibbons just behind my room every morning at 4.45 a.m. to start singing. And mm -hmm. whenever they have a young, and within a few months, whenever, you know, the baby, the moment I see the baby is not hanging on the mother anymore, but, you know, still young. And the, because the gibbons over here are quite dark, and but the babies are very light colored. I can, you know when the baby is singing. It's for trying to mimic the mother or, you know, and you can see it's really mm -hmm. comical, but you know they're doing it. So it's a very young age. That's number one uh, from my experience. Number two, I just want to share something with everybody. Uh, I have a friend. I don't want to mention them their, their names. And they're in Brunei and also in Sabah. And uh, the thing is, I've heard this story from him, but I didn't really want to, I didn't really believe it until I heard it from another reputable person who else don't want to say his name. But then I want to see your point of view. What I heard from, every, from these people is that he has seen uh, a group of gibbons on the ground and suddenly the group of gibbons vanished. Then, <laughs> 10 minutes later, a red leaf monkey came, the group of gibbons came and ripped apart that red leaf monkey and ate it. <laughs> so I've heard, I, I know chimpanzees in Africa, they, they, have, they are known to do this. I want to know from anybody, if anybody has seen something like this or heard from somebody or indigenous people, they have seen something similar of some sort. Many of you are working in the field as well. Have you heard any of things like this? I personally have not seen like this here before. I've only seen gibbons fighting amongst each other or gibbons chase away pigtail macaques, but I've not, or, or sorry, long tail macaques, but I've never actually experienced this and I'm in a jungle all the time. So I would like to hear uh, your, your point of view. Do you think it is possible the gibbons really just ripped apart the red leaf monkey and ate it? And, or have you guys heard similar stories before, either from your uh, partners or field experiences or the indigenous people you work with? Thank you very much. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, Zimbo, just now, have you finished? <laughs> Sorry. I, I didn't want to speak very much. You're all having good fun, so I'm just listening, unless you have some specific question to me. All right. I, I have a question. I have a question. Um, who's going to host the next campfire? Can, can we give it to somebody else? 
Is you? <laughs> no, no, no. I think Malaysia has already done their part. So we're going to hand over. Oh, okay. We're going to hand over the torch uh, to sue anyone who would like to volunteer or be volunteer. Indonesia. I think Indonesia. Ayu. I feel. Are you? Are you? Yeah, waiting for volunteers, is it? <laughs> Suddenly, the yeah, everyone's going to be on. Yeah. Daki, have, Daki, a... yeah, there's a question um, for Zimbo in the Facebook yes. chat, and I already forwarded the question to your chat. Yes, please check okay. your WhatsApp. Yeah, okay, sorry. I have, yeah, I have a question. Okay, uh, okay. Yeah, yeah, go, go ahead, Richard. After this, I'll read for, uh, for, for Zimbo. Yeah, I'd like to know why the maroon or the red langurs in Borneo are so brightly colored. Does that, ma that make them more vulnerable to predation by, for instance, the clouded leopard? Uh, to, or, or, but I have my own hypothesis, but I just want to know if anybody uh, can, uh, can uh, answer that. We know why the orange babies are orange and the langurs on the peninsula, uh, the, uh, the parents can see them better. But uh, what about those red langurs? They seem to be just the, the colors just seem to stand out, make them stand out. Yeah, some uh, language expert, please. Sorry, I missed that question. I was looking for the other question that Jolene mentions. The question is why are maroon languages red? Does that is there a reason? <laughs> is it? Yeah, it makes them stand out more vulnerable to predation to predators like the clouded leopard. Uh, clouded leopards can't see colors, good. so there's no problem there. Yeah, that's a good thing to know. Yeah, that was my hypothesis because they see around so the gray. What spectrum. colors primates see? I mean, we see colors. Birds see colors more than us, up to five different colors. I think five or six different colors. We see primates see up to three different colors. Uh, the pre the mantis shrimp is the best of all. I think about they have sixteen colors. Birds can see UV light, but when it comes to tigers, they ha have a limited range of colors. More like a colorblind person, I would say. Would that right. be the same same reason why uh, the baby uh, dusky langur is orange as well? So that the clouded leopard, it 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 just uh, against the the mother's gray belly, the, the, the little orange infant. Well, here we have to look at the cost and benefit. Think of economics, simple. Whenever you think of any feature, why the feature is there, and you can analyze this yourself. Whenever you see any feature and just say, okay, what's the cost of having that feature? And what's the benefit of having that feature? If that feature is there, that means the benefit must outweigh the cost. There will be cost but the benefit outweigh. So here, the benefit is that one uh, gets the attention of the... And you, you tend to see colorful babies only in social groups, social animals, right? You look at pigs, they have, their babies are boring colors. They blend in with the leaves. So therefore, social animals tend to have uh, colorful babies. One can easily be detected by the other members of the group. And in case of emergencies, let's say there's a threat. All right. Let's say, okay, you mentioned the clouded leopard could be a threat. There could be other threats, other primates, same species or different species. So you tend to see that the nearest animal, say the older sister, older brother, the mother or the auntie will rush to the infant and grab because that new neonate is visible. The adult male typically would be in between, would go in, would notice the, would know where the, in, the neonate is and would rush in between the neonate and the trap. So there's a benefit there. And that's, the other benefit is that, isn't it cute? Now, cute is an important factor. Now, when you, we, we see this a lot in supermarkets and malls before the pandemic, that is, if someone is carrying a baby, everyone goes around and say, oh, what a cute little baby, pin, you know, pinch the cheek and want, want to hold the fingers and whatnot. Yes, a cute baby, a colorful baby attracts members of the group. So that's already an initiation to socialization. 
of the group. And that's where the young animal learns uh, which members of the group is closer to the mom and which one is not that close to the mom. All from the mom's responses, physical response and also through the observation. So I hope that helps you. I try to squeeze everything in so that it doesn't mess up the timing for others. Thank you. Uh, there's a private question in the chat box from Ahmad Zahir Abdul Wahab. Can pet primates be trained and reintroduced back to their natural habitats? Uh, yes and no. It's quite difficult, to be honest. It's very, very difficult. Now, when you say pet primate, how long has it been a pet? All right. And again, it depends also on the species. We have seen macaques adapting to the environment after being released. Okay, they may be a bit abnormal. But then what about other species? They may have difficulty. And I want to push it a bit further. There are many projects dealing with reintroduction, right? Captive breeding or captive breeding and reintroduction or just reintroduction. It's often quite a failure, right? It's quite difficult because they are not familiar with the environment. This goes to all species, by the way. All right. I think that's only two questions for me there. Hmm. Um, I just want to add to Irshad, uh, of course, I'm not a red leaf monkey or orangutan or this kind of expert, but from my experience, right, you know, orangutan or red leaf monkey, they look very um, stand out, right, because of the color. But actually, if you walk in the jungle, right, especially if the red leaf monkey is wide at the top, right, or the orangutan, if you really look up, right, because of the sun rays coming, you know, midday, sometimes the, actually the top of the canopy sometimes looks quite brownish as well and reddish. So it's actually not that easy to see these animals, especially if they stay still or run away. It's not very, it's not actually that distinct. They don't really stand out um, as we think. I only see them whenever they're on the ground. Yeah, I know there's a red leaf monkey, but if they're jumping around in the canopy midday, it's not easy for me to see that. But this is just my observation and thought. Yeah, just sharing. Thanks, Rishabh. Okay, anybody else want to say anything or to share some stories from your side? You can do so. Questions? I just saw somebody said, when is the best time to see slow loris? For me, I would say uh, from my experience over the last uh, six, uh, seven, eight years, the best time to see, of course, is at night during your night walks. But actually, I, I, I don't see them quite often during my night walks. Maybe I see them only a few times a year. The best time to see them are night drives, especially in logging roads. When you do night drives and logging roads, oh, uh, the amount of solarises I see are, are a lot. So that's my experience so far. So night drives, because you cover more distance. So it's a statistical game. In the jungle, I do a night walk, 400 meters maybe. You do a night drive, you're covering like 10 kilometers a night. But yeah, I've noticed, I've seen them a lot in logged uh, forest as well. But yeah, during not night drives, even a primary rainforest or you know, hell, any, any forest, basically. Night drives, for me, have been the most successful to find soil loris in the wild. I hope that answers your question. All right, thank you. Answer is from Borneo, yeah? All right, thank you. So, is Priscilla here, please? Uh, because we have a question from Asen asking about, is ASEA indented in Malaysia? So, maybe some people who are expert in this can try to answer that. Oh, sorry, what's the question again? Is Tasie endangered in Malaysia? Do you get it? Do, do, you, do you mean endangered? Yeah, endangered. Oh, okay, sorry, sorry, I'm not too sure. Yeah, I know there's Western Tasie here, or, or the horse wheel they call it now, but I'm not too sure about the status, yeah. Thank you. So anybody who can help? Or we all are not sure. <laughs> Never mind, maybe we can get back to the question when we get it. Yeah. Um, I thought that uh, since Cindy is here from WCS, uh, and maybe she could share with us a little bit about uh, the effort to 
get the traditional stories uh, from Iban communities. And this is such a great idea uh, for what we could potentially do with indigenous communities in the peninsula. Uh, so Cindy, can you tell us a little bit about that? And uh, for people who are just getting started, how, how would you say that they should approach it? Okay, um, can I share a little bit um, for from our project, the folklore project? This will be a long. <laughs> I, I hope this is this will not boring you all. So, uh, good evening. So I'm Cindy from the WCS Malaysia. So I would like to share about uh, our project, which is the folklore project. So, the idea of using folklore to connect people with their uh, cultural identity and conservation started back in the year 2014 when WCS Malaysia collecting uh, orang utan folklore from communities living in the core habitat at Batang Ai and Lanja and Timau. So the exercise resulted in the publication of Unsra Mayas Ngau Bansa Iban. This is uh, in Iban language because uh, our communities is mostly Ibans. Uh, I think it's all, all Ibans, or uh, in English, it, or translated in English, which is Orang Utan Folklore and Iban Community. So the positive feedback was almost instant as many of the older residents who were the main storytellers realized the, the importance of their role in sharing these oral histories in the community. And when the younger generation recognize the elders as the repository of information of cultural import importance. Since then, we have continued the project to six sites aside the core habitat. These six sites were historically linked to orangutan in the past and identified as the remnant orangutan habitat. So in 2017 until the, and then, and, to the, to the editing for the course of uh, one and a half year, uh, we, connect, we conducted a social survey to gauge communities perception um, towards wildlife, especially the orangutan and the protected forest area near the long houses. So we interview a bunch is very um, many respondents, which is around 917 respondents from 72 villages. So from the social survey, we found that a low percentage respondents answer that the orangutan is still relevant to them and concern if the orangutan cease to exist. However, we found that the most of them answer negative consequences will happen if there were no protected forest areas. So this result, this could be because the local community still heavily rely on the, on the natural resources from the forest for their source of protein and livelihood. Therefore, uh, from because we found that there is a low percentage of um, awareness towards orangutan, we follow we, we, we came up with the follow-up activity to address the low awareness, which is the which is the co uh, collecting follow from the communities from this area. So we began to collect folklore with two of the six sites. That we saw, uh, we, that we conducted social survey, which is uh, namely in this is in Sarawak, namely Sabal and Gunung Lesong, or commonly known as uh, Bukit Linga for the Iban community here. So the aim of this project is to re-establish the sense of ownership and cultural association with wildlife, especially with orangutan. We have interviewed more than thirty storytellers, and fifty stories were recorded in Iban language. Then we shot after much discussion and filter uh, the stories for the repetitive uh, um, for repetitive stories. So we have shortlisted about more than 20 stories and edited them based on the Iban language accuracy. The book then published on December 2019 titled Jerita Jelusiga Ngao Penghidup Bangsa Iban. Uh, in Iban language and then we translated into English language to so that uh, we can uh, take the book to into the international level, uh, title um, Wildlife Tales and Iban Myth from Sabal and Gunola Song. It was published in early 2021, which is uh, the uh, which is um, first this uh, this year. 
So um, some skeptic may question, how does folklore or literature can contribute to the conservation of life, of our life? So at WCS Malaysia, we believe that the conservation should be inclusive. So in order to do so, uh, the message needs to reach the public in any form that appeals to them. And in this case, folklore may appeal to literature and oral history buff like myself. Um, for, uh, for your information, I am uh, Iban myself. So this is uh, like uh, rediscovering my own roots. So this is like uh, in Bahasa Malaysia, we say menyelam sampai minum air or English press um, uh, kill two birds with one stone. So sharing right. oral history does not only uh, appeal to the liter literally, com literally community, it reminds us the indigenous community of our origin, our practices and how this relate to wildlife conservation. For example, one story featured in the book is about a young Iban maiden who married an orangutan oh. spirit. So, I think we have to. We have to. Can you just put it, your response in the chat? I think there's a lot of questions. Oh, okay, okay. Still. All right, right. Thank you so much for sharing. We really enjoyed. Your, All right, uh, right. Thank you. All right. Congratulations again. All right. All right, right. Okay. Thank you. Zaki, you wanted to ask some more questions. All right. I'm sorry. Uh, actually, uh, someone just um, <clears throat> Jolin already sent the question to Zimbo. Uh, can Zimbo maybe maybe you want to respond to the question? What's the question? Uh, which question are you referring to? By Ko? By Ko, yes. Uh, I have responded that in the chat box, but I can also repeat it. Okay, let's go back to the question again. Ah, okay, here. Yeah. What do you say if someone argue that infanticide and cheating in a romantic relationship are natural? Okay. Uh, now, are you referring to humans or the non-human primates? Because in pr primates in general, infanticide is practiced, but whether it's normal or not depends on the species and depending on the ecological variables. All right. Uh, Infanticide does not mean only by the parent, but can be by other individuals, like during a male takeover of a harem group in proboscis monkeys, for example, or the langurs. All right. So, and in other cases, it could be due to other ecological pressures, which some of it could be human made also, or you know, human induced pressures. Now, when it comes to cheating, in some species, it's normal. All right. Uh, in other species, again, very rarely could be due to some other ecological variables. But then if you're talking about human primate, yes, human primates cheat, but it doesn't mean it's okay. Right? That's, we have to be very clear here what is okay and what is not okay. But does it exist? Yes, it does occur. Does infanticide occur in human? Yes, it does occur. Does uh, cheating occur in human? Yes, it does occur. But then we also come up with mechanisms. It, they could be social mechanisms, they could be various kinds of norms to prevent such incidences from happening. All right. It can happen. There are mechanisms. I hope that responded to you very in a brief manner. Otherwise, again, it's going to be a very long lecture. <laughs> Thank you, Zimbo. All right. Thank one you. last question. I would like to channel this question to Nadine um, from Andrew Wuhu from Facebook. Um, love the story of the greater. Directed tail drongos symbiotic relationship with langurs. Are there any other interesting symbiotic relationship between primates and any other animals? Maybe Nadine can respond a bit. Hi, sorry, my internet is, is very slow, so <laughs> it's all lagging a lot. I that's a really interesting question. And I tried to think about it when Zaki sent me the question just now, but spontaneously, I, I just really can't come up with an answer. Again, I might refer to Zimbo here. I think there are a few more in primates. And it's just that the racket tail drongo and the langur is such a, an interesting story that has always um, stuck with us since we study the langurs that just out of the top of my head, I'm, I'm a bit blur now, I admit. So maybe Zimbo has an answer to that. <laughs> 
Yeah, maybe Zimbo can add. Yes, I heard something about interspecific relations. Can can you repeat the question? I was my mind was somewhere else. I was doing some multitasking as usual. Sure. Um, he said that he loves the story of greater record tail drongo symbiotic relationship with the Langers. Mm -hmm. So are there any other interesting symbiotic relationship between primates and other animals? Oh yeah, Saki, plenty. It's okay. Saki, give him plenty. Time. Sorry. Uh you have something to say? Okay. Uh there are plenty around that one that comes to mind immediately comes off the top of my head is the the cows and the Zanzibar Zanzibar red colobus, I think. Right? So the cows groom, I'm uh, sorry, the the langurs there, the colobines, the colobus there, they groom the cows. Right? They groom the cows, they feed on the parasite, the cows benefit from the uh, the langurs by removing the parasite and how do langurs benefit? Well, the cows go around feeding in this type of habitat known as uh, ikwamba, it, uh, the shamba, shamba, sorry, in Zanzibar. It's a shamba. It's sort of a degraded forest. So by the trampling of the cows trampling and movement and feeding, it creates food source for the colob colobines or colobus there. So that's one that comes to mind. I think that's quite a, in, in Thailand, qu quite common. You see temple monkeys and dogs. In some places, the dogs chase away the monkeys, but in, in some places, the dogs protect the monkeys. Why? Because monkeys have uh, pentadactylism. They, are, they have quite, uh, what do you call, flexible fingers, which means they're grooming. So the monkeys groom the dogs and in turn the dogs protect the monkeys and other than that well i guess uh i wouldn't call it mutualism but there's in there's relation there's interrelationship between primates and non-human uh, sorry non-primate species i hope that helps yes help yeah it's very much thank you so much so uh, actually, we are already 18 minutes past 10. Uh, maybe it's about time we call it a day. So perhaps before we stop, um, Justin, do you want to say anything? No, but I'm fine. Can we? All right. <laughs> Thank you so much. So Thank you, again, everybody. I'm sorry. Yes. I just thought of that. I just wanted to say we, we did this on a rather spur of the moment. It's not the, the way that we usually run events, but but it's been so gratifying to have the spontaneous support and interest from so many. And I think we're all richer from sharing our collective experiences, especially from other sites in the region. We should do this again. Thank you, everyone. Yes, I agree. Thank you so much, Justin. And everybody, all of you who join us from the beginning until the end, and we would like to thank you by all our heart. And for the, all the content contributors today, thank you so much for your participation, for the organizing committees and everyone who take part in organizing this program. On behalf of the organizer, I would like to say thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. All right. So um, that's all for our campfire today. I'm so proud to be here with you all. Thank you so much, guys. See you again. Bye-bye. Good night. Good night. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night. Bye. 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 Bye, everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.